Hey guys, you're watching Python tutorial videos on my YouTube channel Python for Microscopist. In the last few tutorials, you learned about autoencoders, the basics of those, and in fact, in the last couple of tutorials, we covered the topic of uh, one of the applications of autoencoders, which was denoising images. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be images, it can denoise any input data, okay, as long as you get the data in the right format. Same thing applies for anomaly detection. You can apply this to images, for example. Let's say you have a whole bunch of uh, uh, healthy cells and uh, a few, let's say, unhealthy infected cells. Then you can train the algorithm on these healthy cells and anything that doesn't fit the description of healthy would be flagged as anomaly uh, detection, right, as an anomaly. So uh, let's use the same technique. In fact, instead of working on images, I actually created synthetic data in a uh, Excel or a CSV file where I have two columns and uh, introduced some anomalies occasionally so we can, uh, we can read that uh, data. But again, as long as you can get your images into a form that uh, you, know, you can use in your, uh, in your uh, deep learning or autoencoders, then you can use any, any data. Because for a computer, it doesn't care if it's an image, if it's a sound file, or if it is a, if it is a video file, or any other type of data. So with that understanding, again, let's also look at, uh, remind ourselves what autoencoders are. Again, it's uh, basically uh, neural networks that are organized such a way that the input image, the dimensions are reduced, and then, which is called uh, encoding phase, and the dimensions are again brought back or upscaled to the original size, and this is the decoding phase. And the idea of autoencoder is to reconstruct the original image by going through this process. And it, during this process of reconstruction, the weights and biases are adjusted, meaning you're creating a model that you can use to reconstruct future images. So we take advantage of this concept by feeding the input uh, you know, for example, for uh, denoising, we just supplied a noisy image and reconstructed a healthy image, meaning during the training phase, our X is going to be the noisy image and our Y, uh, when we are fitting a model, is going to be the healthy image. Now for, uh, let me skip, actually we are looking at anomaly, so let's actually look at this anomaly detection example here. So you have a whole bunch of data and now, what if we, uh, I should mention you have a whole bunch of annotated data, right? Everyone has data. Not many people have the luxury of annotated data, which means someone probably told that, okay, wherever you see these kind of spikes, this is not good. This is bad response. Wherever you see something else, that's good. Maybe the spikes are expected, but as an expert, you need to say that, okay, you need to label this data by saying, okay, for this stream of data, which could be the power output of one of the lasers in your confocal microscope, okay? So, okay, that looks very stable, and you may set some threshold and say, okay, this is an anomaly, this is an anomaly, tell me when that happens, right? And this could be, I don't know, the detector sensitivity, yeah? And this could be something else. So you may be working with a whole bunch of streams of data coming from one single microscope or any other example you can think of. If you work on some other instrument, you know, or some other situation, you'll have a whole bunch of uh, uh, data. Well, this can be even sports data. This can be how my quarterback is performing and this is how my running back is performing and uh, per game and you can actually have like a date versus the performance and then you can say okay what's an anomaly is my quarterback distracted i don't know you know is the quarterback healthy or not healthy so uh, you can think of many situations you know where you can use this anomaly what is normal and what is abnormal right so how do we detect anomalies it's very simple you just train the system on a whole bunch of uh, good data meaning non anomaly data right and then anything that falls out of that norm is automatically labeled anomaly okay that's very simple that's it so uh, which means we are looking at the reconstruction error for our anomaly data for regular data the reconstruction error would be lower compared to the reconstruction error for the anomaly data that's it so we take this uh, simple thing to actually build our to build our uh, uh, autoencoder for anomaly detection. So let's go ahead and jump in. And by the way, the data I synthetically created is okay. There is a date, 
uh, uh, starting from January 2016. It goes all the way to December 2019. I'm recording this in January, early January of 2020. So for about uh, uh, three years, I have the data of uh, you know for the power of the laser for example and the detector sensitivity and someone labeled it as good or bad right so if the power is centered around uh, i believe i did 95 or something then it is good and if the detector is centered around uh, eight or nine uh, it is good now if it goes below certain threshold it is bad this is obviously a synthetic data meaning you know, I'm just using it uh, uh, for the tutorial purpose, but in real life, situations can be a bit more complicated. In fact, you can basically say uh, bad is when you're, uh, let's say you're working with uh, an X-ray source and your X-ray all of a sudden goes, you know, stops, right? So that's bad. So in real life, you may have situations where you have real data where things went bad. But for now, let's just look at this. So this is in a CSV file. Again, I don't wanna make this a pandas tutorial because I've already done that in the past. So I, I will just go ahead and copy and paste the code, but I'll explain it while we are going along, okay? Okay, let me paste the code I copied from this other document and there you go. And I'm not uh, going to dwell too much time on how the data you know, got structured, although I think it makes sense to explain that a little bit. But uh, again, at the end of this, what we are trying to do is all this part, let me quickly mention, all the uh, up to here, like the first 40 lines is, okay, how do I structure my data? After that, it's very simple. It's basically, this is my model, sequential, starting with, uh, again, I'm only using dense layers here because this is, uh, uh, a stream of uh, data and not images. Okay, if it is images, then I recommend using the convolutional layers because convolutional layers, uh, you work with these 2D images, right? So the spatial information is retained and uh, 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 you can leverage the spatial uh, information, you know, to gain insights into your data. Now here for dense layers, you have to collapse your 2D into 1D vector. So for images, I do not recommend working with dense layers uh, uh, unless you get to the classification point, which is not what we're discussing right now. We're discussing autoencoders. So uh, again, for streams of data, dense layers are okay. Okay, so this is this part is our uh, autoencoder, that's it, okay? It starts with uh, a dimension of 10, goes down to dimension of three, and then reconstructs back to 10, and now finally uh, we are uh, reshaping it and printing it out, okay? And uh, at the end of this, uh, we are going to fit this model to our, uh, you know, to the same, right? So again, let me go back to the uh, presentation I showed you earlier. Eventually, we are fitting the model on X and X, meaning we are mapping X to X itself. Our output is same as our input. This is what an autoencoder is. That's exactly what we are trying to do here, okay? I'm going to, uh, I'm going to create a vector called X, sorry, I didn't mean to change it. I'm going to create a vector called X underscore good underscore train, obviously representing all the good data points that I showed you earlier, all the good data points. And for all the bad data points or data points that are tagged as bad, I'm gonna use that uh, as my validation data for anomalies, right? Good is not an anomaly, bad is an anomaly. So uh, the model is fit on the good data, both X and X, okay, both are good. And let's do it for 100 epochs. And then I'm going to predict it on uh, the X good test data set that we are holding out uh, uh, you know, uh, for testing, for validation. And I'm also going to predict it on uh, the mean squared error on the bad data set. Is, uh, my hope, again, what basically the by design, what it's going to do is anything that is good, the mean squared error should be within certain acceptable limits, right? So that's the uh, uh, presumption. And anything that is a bad data set, the mean squared error should be larger compared to uh, these two. And then we are going to print it out, okay? So this is how we design this. And just to give a quick overview of uh, how I'm handling the data, again, I'm using Pandas database, uh, I mean, sorry, Pandas, uh, 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 library to handle the data and uh, I did cover this topic in one of my previous tutorials so please go ahead and watch it if you want to learn more about it. So step number one uh, importing our anomaly.csv file and we have uh, four columns date, power, detector and quality. 
okay? Now, date is irrelevant for us because uh, we're not doing any forecasting. We are just uh, trying to build a model using the good data sets. And then anything that's not good is going to be a, uh, a uh, anomaly, okay? So this means we have to drop some data uh, from, from here. Step number one, drop the date column, okay? Because that's irrelevant. Step number two, separate the good uh, data points from the bad data points because we want to train our model only on the good data points. So these steps are all designed to do exactly that. And finally, of course, as we are doing this, we would like to replace the text good with a value of one, text bad with a value of two, because uh, obviously uh, the, the computer, the system works with numbers and not with text. Uh, so we need to do that uh, as, as uh, part of our process. So these are the steps. So initially I uh, loaded the, uh, I mean, uh, read the CSV into the system. And then uh, now uh, you can actually look at, by the way, let's go ahead and run this up to this point. So now here you can see I have 407 bad data points and 1,054 uh, data points, well, I say bad data points, data points that are labeled bad and 1,054 data points that are labeled good, okay? Uh, now, if you're doing classification type of problem, right, okay, if you're trying to say, okay, uh, if certain, uh, as, you know, uh, create a model where uh, you spit out uh, good and also bad, then it's important to have like uh, bad data points balanced with the good, maybe have like almost 1000 of each, then you can do some data augmentation or something. But remember, we are doing a anomaly detection, meaning we can work with 1054 good data points and completely ignore all the 1407 bad data points. Well, ignore during the training process, but then we are gonna use those data points to see how good our uh, anomaly detection is uh, working. Okay, and uh, here I'm actually dropping the date uh, column right there, so that's what uh, this line does. And uh, here I'm dropping any missing entries. For example, here I have all values for every day, but sometimes, some days you may not be taking the readings for power and detector. So if you have any blanks, uh, one way to include those is by replacing the blanks with an average of the value before and after. That kind of works. But uh, if you have a lot of data points, go ahead and uh, drop uh, the, the blanks. Okay, that's what that line does over there. And these two lines here, uh, we are just assigning good equal to one and bad equals to two. So replacing the value good with a value of one. Now, we need to separate the good from the bad ones. So the way I chose to do that here is create a mask for all the data points where uh, uh, the value equals to one and my bad mask is all the data points where my value equals to two. Once I have that, then I can actually create a data frame called a data frame good with only the ones that are uh, good. And data frame bad is the only the ones where the, the label equals to true, you know, for bad data points. So that's what we're doing here. And also uh, I dropped the quality column here. So we dropped this quality uh, uh, from our data frame. Okay, uh, now where do I go? Uh, we drop the quality because for training purposes, we only need power and detector values, right? We only need the values of real variables. We don't need the, uh, we don't need the outcome as part of our training process. That's the reason why I dropped the quality over there, okay? So that's it. So finally, if you if I run the code all the way up to this point, you will see that, okay, we have initially 407 bad ones and 1,054 good ones. And after separation and everything, so if I go back here, what we are printing here is after separating them as good data frame and bad data frame, I have 1,054 good ones, 407 bad ones, meaning I didn't make a mistake, well, uh, 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 in this process, okay? So again, a sanity check that I always try to do. Okay, so what goes into our autoencoder is a vector, so the data frame itself is not good enough, so I'm going to extract the values from my data frame and assign it to a vector right there, okay? So these are the feature vectors that I'm going to use. In fact, the good is the only feature vector I'm going to use as part of my neural network, okay? So now, instead of using all the data points in good, meaning all the 1,054 data points, I want to hold out 25% as uh, validation data or testing data. 
So the way I do that is using the train test split method inside this uh, library, uh, scikit-learn model selection. So 75% of my good data is assigned as x good train, 25% is assigned as x good test. Okay, that's all it is. Now again, you can go ahead and print this to see how much good, how much bad. So let's run this. So as you can see, of all the 1,054 data points, 790 are going to be used as part of my training and 264 are going to be held out for testing or validation purposes. So this is how I, I kind of designed my data. And I already explained this part, right? So, uh, Let's go ahead and run it. So eventually we are going to look at what the score is for my uh, for my uh, prediction on good test data set. This is the 25% data set that we are holding out. How it is uh, for my X good, which is the entire data that we used for, well, that we uh, uh, have for good data points, meaning 1,000, whatever, 54 data points and then how well the prediction is going to be on the bad data points. And again, the assumption is because this is anomaly detection, the good, these two probably are very close and the bad ones uh, should be uh, probably uh, at least 50% uh, higher or, you know, uh, error. So let's go ahead and run this. Where are we? Okay, let's run this for 100 epochs, I believe. There you go. Okay, finally, here are the values. So uh, I should have said out of sample. This is not out of sample. This is basically the entire data set. But anyway, the, the, the good score seems to be centered around 1.44, uh, as you can see for in both cases, right? So the 25% of data set, the good test data set, which is the validation data set that never went through our auto encoders is giving us a, a reconstruction error of 1.44. And the entire good data set is giving us 1.44, but the bad data uh, or the anomalies uh, give higher uncertainty or higher reconstruction errors, more than two times actually here. Okay, so this is this is in summary, this is what autoencoders are, where you train it on a bunch of data that you think is normal behaving or good data set, and then anything that doesn't fit within certain limits, you know, uh, uh, after reconstruction, we are just calling them anomalies or outliers, okay? So uh, I showed you this example on some synthetic data. I encourage you to work on a data set that you can find online. If you Google search for malaria cell database, uh, you know, data set for neural networks, you'll find it online. And this is a data set where you have a whole bunch of images for healthy cells and a whole bunch of images uh, uh, that are infected with malaria. And uh, I recommend you to train an autoencoder uh, such as this one, but use the neural networks, uh, I mean, use the convolutional layers and uh, dense is also okay, but uh, design your own, uh, uh, your own uh, network and then train it on all the good images and then test it on the infected images and you will see higher uh, reconstruction errors. So that way you can actually design your own malaria uh, detecting you know, uh, autoencoder. I hope you learned something through this video and if you like it, please go ahead and like it. And if you, if you like the content I'm producing, please subscribe to this channel. It definitely keeps me encouraged to work on more such content. So thank you very much for your attention.